I have several nephews, but these two specifically were herding sheep for our grandparents. They were on their summer break and complaining of nothing to do. So my brother dropped them off and told them to help grandma and grandpa and learn how to work. Well, back in my day, I herded sheep and also heeded warnings, especially the ones about staying away from an area. So they heard sheep and curiosity got the best of them. It didn't help any when their friend lived close by. Most of the time the sheep wore water at a nearby windmill. So just to see what they could get away with, they told their grandparents that the windmill was not producing any water. There was a pond near the mountain where we were warned to stay away from. Grandma and Grandpa told them to take the sheep to the pond and to get back right away. So they swore they would be back ASAP. They were excited, but they walked slowly and trying not to show it. As soon as they walked over the hill, they decided to take their friend with them. So they played along the way it took at least two and a half hours to get there. The sheep drank water and started resting under some greasy wood. That's when they started saying let's go up there and see what everyone is so scared of. They started crawling and got almost to the top. But they wanted to check out the black smudge they saw from afar as they were bringing the sheep to the water. They walked over a waste and saw that it was a cave. They talked about whether they should check out the cave. Of course the older nephew was just wanting to see what was inside. They walked in and noticed that the cave went further back. His friend and little brother didn't want to go any further and they told him to go ahead. He started walking further in and it started getting smaller to the point where there was only a crawl space. He got down on his knees and started crawling. As he was going further back he noticed that the cave walls had handprints in reddish brown. He said there were also fragments of bones on the floor of the cave. He said there were also fragments of bones on the floor of the cave. It was getting darker as he went further than he remembered. It was getting darker as he went further in. Then he remembered he had a lighter on him. He crawled a little bit further and the tunnel gave way where he touched the floor and could stand. As he looked around, there was even more smear handprints. Bigger bones scattered everywhere. He said the smell was very, very terrible, almost like rotting roadkill. He also said there were a lot of beads and different types of skins. He went a little further in around a bend and that's when he saw the worst thing you could imagine. It was the body of a young girl. He took a closer look and he said the flesh was torn out like the way a dog eats. He started shaking really bad and he went back around the bend. That's when he heard them shouting telling him to get out. They were saying that they're coming. He crawled out the cave just in time to see some vehicles coming to the mountain. He noticed it was dusk and they just had enough time to crawl behind some bushes. They cowered low and saw some old men and women, along with young women and men. What astounded him was that there were boys as old as he was. When it seemed like they were in the clear, they got down as fast as they could and started running as fast as they could. That's when my nephews would remember the sheep, but by this time it was dark. They were too scared to look for them. As they got closer to home, they saw that the sheep were barely walking. Before they got home, they all promised they wouldn't tell anyone about what transpired among them. Later that night, the older nephew got really sick. They took him to the hospital, and he stayed there for a couple of days. He was getting bad nightmares until he couldn't stand it any longer. So he ended up telling his parents. They had a ceremony for him, which lasted two days. Two missionaries started coming around, and they came on a constant basis. The boys got comfortable with them, and they told him their experience. One of the missionaries got in his head that he had to see it. Well, he did, and he ended up getting really sick, to the point where he had to end his mission and go home. I heard later on that he died. I'll have to finish the story some other time. The sun is starting to go down. I truly do believe that they can listen. They can track you down and do evil things to you. So this is the only inner woods experience that I already ever had. I ended up moving to Ohio the other summer 
just to live at this community art house. It was pretty cool in its heyday, but the rooms barely get rented now. I'm personal friends with the owners, so I was offered a permanent residency, provided that I help maintain the property, so I ended up moving. The house was big. It was an old Victorian style home that they converted into their charity house. The house itself was four stories with a huge wraparound porch that was built on top of one of the highest peaks in the town, the Ohio Valley. Now this house, even though it was greatly remodeled from its original condition, it still required a lot of renovations. The only way to enter was through the back door, through the garden, up a flight of stairs that would take you to the second story of the house. When you entered through the second story, you would come into this narrow dark hallway that had painted maroon ceilings. This floor had the kitchen and four other rooms that were turned into sewing rooms, printing rooms and other workshops workspace rooms. By the kitchen, there was a stairway that brought you down into the first floor. The first floor was converted into gallery rooms. There was also access to the front porch, but we barely went out there because it was pretty unstable. Half of the first floor was converted into a personal apartment that they were hoping to rent out. This floor also had access to the basements where they had a dark room, some screen printing machines and all that kind of stuff. The old bathroom walls were torn down, so the toilet was exposed too. Nobody used it, but it still looked used if you get what I mean. The basement had outdoor access but no lock, and my friend's mom even warned me to barricade it at night to prevent intruders. On the second floor, right beside the stairwell, was a closet looking door that led up to the attic. Behind this narrow door was a beautiful wooden stairwell that wrapped upwards to a hall with five bedrooms. When I was moving in, two of the bedrooms had been rented out. I was offered the apartment on the first floor, but it was kind of creepy down there, so I moved into the room in the attic. One guy is a 23 year old poet he seemed pretty cool. We hit it off pretty well. All of his favorite stories were about, well, let's say rated R, but whatever. You know people like what they like. The other was a 19 year old girl. She was pretty quiet. She seemed pretty polite and mature for her age. She was also a pretty conservative girl for her age. I thought she was cute anyways. The poet said that he thought something was off about her. Anyways. Right across the street from this house was the town cemetery. The cemetery had a zigzag road that went about two miles up the side of a mountain. I went hiking to the top by myself one day to take a look at the valley. One side overlooked the town, but when you turned around, there was a large building and some dense woods. I noticed a dirt trail in between a couple of trees. At first, I thought it was private property because it looked close to the building but I didn't see any signs against it. The path looked pretty well walked and just off grid. I walked towards the path, and then this bulldozer appeared from what I thought was a dead end or a driveway. I walked near a ledge to see that they were making new roads in the mountainside. The dozer just popped up from a hidden hill. The driver stops and looks over at me. Howdy. I was kinda shocked that he stopped to say hi. I thought I was in trouble for trespassing. I then say, Hey, I'm sorry, was I trespassing? Not that I'm aware of, he says. Uh, well, the road looks great so far. Do you know if it's open to the public? I don't see any signs or ropes around. The driver looked at me and smirked as if he thought that I was trying to be a smart ass. He then said, I guess as long as you don't get in our way, I suppose you're free to use the trails, but I recommend that you come back with a friend. There are creatures out in these parts. I then think to myself, why did you say creatures? I then try holding a longer conversation to find out more, but he just starts dozing away. As I'm watching him drive off, this old man on a lawnmower rides up beside me. I thought he'd try to say hello, but he couldn't even hear me with the dozer so close to us. I then say, howdy. He looks at me, smirks and says, you're not from around here are you? I then say, what gave me away? He then grinned a wise, toothless grin and said, well, your shoes and your hair look too nice to be working out in the sun. You must be from the city. 
I then say, you got me there. I'm actually from Chicago. He then said, ah, that's right, a big city talker. So you don't know anything about these woods, huh? Just be careful out there. We got a lot of creatures out and about. And you got yours too, I'm sure. I then said, so I heard. What kind of creatures are out this way? He then says, well, Sonny, I've been living around these parts for my entire life. And there are things that I can explain and things that I can't explain. As far as you going hiking, I just warn you to stick to the roads if you don't have a friend and watch out for snakes and wolves. He rambles on for a bit, but I'm not in a hurry. So I'll let the man speak for a bit longer. He then mentions, I was also best friends with the man whose house you're staying in. He's buried around here too. I like to think that I'm still around for him, looking out for him. This kind of creeped me out that he knew the house I came from, considering that I didn't see him on my way up, nor did I mention anything about where I was staying. He then says, anyways, I'll let you choose your path, young man. And he just starts going down the mountainside. I decided not to take the trail right away since there were plenty of daylight hours to burn. So I headed back down to the house to see if any other residents would be up for a hike. Because apparently I'm going to die in the woods. Why be alone, right? I don't see the girl around. But then I asked the poet if he would be up for it because he seemed like the fit type anyways. He was reading a book and said that he wasn't in the mood. Which I actually understood and was kind of expecting. And then I turned around to see the girl standing in the doorway to the attic. I'll go with you, she says. The poet puts down the book he was reading and looks up. She then says, this house is too quiet for me. It'll be nice to get out. The poet then jumps up. Yeah, what a great idea. Let's do it. We can pack the bags and get some rope and see how extreme we can get out in these woods. I then start to think, is he trying to come off like he proposed the idea? But whatever, I'm just happy to have people come along. I get some rope, some gloves, some snacks, and anything we might need to get ready for this venture. And this whole time, this poet guy is trying to hit on this clearly uninterested girl. It's about 3 o'clock when we head up to the cemetery road again. We reach the top at around 4, and it seemed that the maintenance workers were gone for the evening. The girl notices the buildings as we get closer to them. Are you sure we can be here? Isn't this property private? I then say, I talked with a couple of guys earlier. They said everything was fine. We get closer to the hidden path that I noticed from before. I then say, here, this way. The poet looks at me like I'm crazy and says, Dude, I don't think the lady wants to get tangled in shrubs. We should just take the road. The girl turned around, visibly angry, and said, I can speak for myself, and I'm not afraid of any little dirt road. The poet then just grumbles. We get to what I thought was the entrance to a long trail, but it was just a dirt clearing maybe five feet long between some trees. I then say, that's weird. I thought the trail was longer. The poet guy then says, your trail is nothing. Let's go back to the real trail before we get ticks. The girl then stands on the edge of the dirt path and points ahead. Do you guys see that? I walk over to her and notice that even though the dirt trail ends, there's a significant clearing in the woods. Many trees have been taken down. I didn't question it. I figured it was just Ohio industry, but there was a clear path, so we chose to follow it. The other guy then starts bitching. The girl is just quietly observing. I'm leading us when I stop to make a remark. Wait, before we get too far into this, we should mark some trees. That way, we know how to get back out. I took out my knife and marked an X on every few trees that we passed. I made sure all the ones I carved were sturdy growing trees. We move around these woods for about half a mile when we start to see rooftops. As we got closer, we began to see the top of another town. As we get closer to the ledge, we noticed a different, visibly walked path that was still hidden behind the trees, high up in the mountain. But standing from it, you could see the houses pretty well. I remember looking down for a moment and noticing that one of the closer homes had a light on. As I was staring, a naked woman passed by. 
and closed the window and pulled her curtains. I got the most uncomfortable feeling ever. The girl then says, Wow, look at this view. I wonder if anybody knows about this path up here. The guy then says, So are we going to stick with this one? Or are we heading back up through the mountain? No one else was creeped out about this weird hidden trail. So I marked an X at the point that we found the path from the woods. And we continue onward. It's about 5.30 and the sun is beginning to go down. We had followed this walking path for about an hour or so when I crossed my X again. I then say, hey, look at this, y'all, and I point down. The poet guy rages. Are you kidding me? We have been walking around in a circle for more than an hour. Screw you, man. This whole thing is done. The poet guy then leaves and heads back up the mountain towards the spot where we came from. I honestly don't care at this point, and I just turn to the girl. What do you suppose we do? She's still overlooking the town from this path. She then says, It's like you can watch the whole world, and they don't even know that somebody is watching them. The tone in her voice really creeped me out, and her voice was deeper sounding than what I remember. But again, she barely even spoke at all. I then say, maybe we should follow him back up the mountain. And that's when she turned her head in the weirdest way I ever seen. She then says, if that's what's going to make you feel safe. I'm seriously starting to get creeped out. And I just decided to book it up the mountain without her approval. I'm on all four scaling up this mountain path. I'm not sure why. But I start to feel this urge to just rush out of there so fast. There was some sort of feeling inside of me that was telling me that I was in danger. I then run up to a point where I feel like I'm hanging off the side. I look down for a moment and see the top of the girl's head. And suddenly, she turns her head and screams at me. I swear, it looked like she had some pointed teeth or fangs or something. I'm nearly pissing myself at this point. And I'm just trying to scale over to another ledge. I'm able to pull myself off with the help of a fallen tree limb. I look over the ledge that I climbed up for a second to catch my breath. And I don't see her anymore. I yell the poet's name. And I didn't get a reply. I look down at the tree that helped me escape. It also had an X. I then say, fuck this. So I start running up the thing as fast as I can. Until I reach a flat patch in the forest where I can just run. I then see this clearing between the trees. I walk this path until I hit a dead end. I look down and notice the 5 foot dirt path. I overshot it a bit when I was panicked. But whatever, I'll just climb down. I pull out my rope and find a tree to tie down and scale down. As I'm about to scale down, a hand covers my mouth from behind and pulls me back behind a tree. It's the poet guy. He's all cut up. He has marks all over him. He's covered in blood and dirt and everything else. I know I looked a little beat up too, but he looked like he was all jacked up. He had a black eye and everything. He put his finger over his mouth and pointed down. I turned around to look down the path again. The girl was there without a single mark on her. She stood on the path completely still for about two minutes. Then she screamed again. But this time, it was terrifying. She began to like, I don't know, shake or move weird for 30 seconds before she turned still. She turned to face the woods again. I'll meet both of you back at home. And then she walked out into the clearing and down the trail. We waited for about 5 minutes before heading down and out. We made it back to the cemetery around 7. And the man that I came across was there. And he said, I'm glad you took my advice and brought a friend. The poet guy and I headed back to the house and the girl wasn't there. We decided to check her room and it looked like nobody was living there. It's almost like somebody had just never unpacked or just didn't have anything with them. It was empty. What didn't sit well with us was that he said she had lived here when he got here and she was always kind of disappearing going out late so we kind of wonder if she did this to other people the poet guy just up and left town the next day i stayed in ohio for about a month or so 
I eventually asked my friends who owned the house about the residence for that week. And she told me that the poet guy and I were the only people staying that she knew about. I don't fully understand what happened in the forest or in that house or who she was or anything. But for the rest of my time there, the rest of that month, I just couldn't do anything without feeling like somebody or something was watching me. So I have the story of when I had to travel to Nevada for family stuff. And this was in March or April of 2019. I just got my license then too. And I had to travel with my dad's side of the family near the National Forest. My dad's brother had unfortunately passed away. So we were going for a funeral. My uncle lived in the middle of nowhere. No neighbors or anything. And my father ended up getting a rental car. So a day after we arrived, we wanted to get takeout, but the closest place was forever away, but I was that hungry. So my dad gave me the keys to the rental. It was a 2017 Honda Civic, and it was about 9 p.m. when I left. It takes about 15 minutes to get to the place, but I was craving pizza that bad. Around 10 p.m., I was driving down the road with nothing but wood surrounding me. I was listening to music but it was pretty low and suddenly I got a horrible feeling like a really bad pain in my stomach and just the general uneasiness that's when the feeling of being watched came over me I'm not sure how as I'm going 60 miles per hour on a road with no other cars in sight I looked in my rear view mirror and immediately I saw something running behind my car right in front of the trees I couldn't see it that well but it was keeping up with me and it looked to be at least seven feet tall. I had already heard the stories about these things, about the skinwalkers and such. So I had a general idea of what it was and I put the pedal to the metal. I'm now riding 80 plus and the thing is still keeping up with me. I didn't know what to do so I just pressed even more and went faster. Right as I stopped and looked around, I was way up the road and it was gone. I felt like pissing my pants. I was paralyzed with fear. I was too scared to start driving again but too scared to sit there. I saw something about 10 feet into the woods and in that moment of not thinking straight, I turned off the music and rolled down the windows. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I could see a silhouette running away from me. There were no footsteps, but I could hear branches being broken and leaves being crushed. I floored it to the pizza place. I got in there and bought my pizza. I was pale as the white Civic that I was driving. The cashier asked me if I was okay. I said that something was chasing me. I straight up told her what happened. She said it happened semi-often. Most people just simply ignore it. She asked me if I was from around here. I told her that I came to visit some family. She said that if I saw it again on the way back, just act like it isn't there. And I'm thinking, how the hell am I supposed to do that? On the drive back, I was so scared, but I didn't see it on the way to the house. I told my dad and my uncle's wife about it. My dad thought that I was just BSing or being paranoid. He doesn't believe in supernatural stuff. My uncle's wife then interrupted him and said that actually around here, it's pretty common. But even then, my dad wasn't sure. She told us stories of encounters that she has had. As I was going to my room, she asked me a question. She said if anything sounds strange or seems off, to please tell her. Well, my first thought was that this shit wasn't over yet. So at about 3 a.m., I was sleeping in the guest bedroom on the second floor. And that's when I started hearing faint noises from the woods. Even though I was still scared, I told myself it was most likely just foxes or some random wildlife. The noises became louder as time went on. There was a screech every 10 to 20 seconds. I've been hunting a lot where I live in North Carolina and it's definitely not a fox or anything. When the screeching got loud enough to interrupt my attempts to sleep, it stopped. The house got real quiet. No crickets, no owls, nothing. 
Suddenly, I heard a rabbit squeal and a couple of squirrels chirping. My window was slightly open as the heat in my room was unbearable and I couldn't turn it down. I thought it was most likely a fox or a wolf hunting rabbits. But then, I heard a noise. I have no way to describe it, but it sounded like someone just smacking raw meat against their hand. That's full of ranch dressing. I was getting myself ready to be terrified again. I grabbed my flashlight and slowly crept my way to the window. I wanted to get a good look at whatever it was. If it was what I fear, I was going to spring as fast as I could into my uncle's wife's room. I have no idea what force compelled me to peer down into the backyard. As I looked down, I saw, quite possibly, my worst nightmare. A gray figure with a deer-like head hunched over a gore fest of a rabbit. I didn't know rabbits even had that much blood in them. The dude was just sticking his fingers into its guts and licking the blood off its fingers. About two seconds after I got the light on, he gave me an evil stare. However, its eyes were completely black, not even a reflection of the light from my flashlight. I was paralyzed with fear. He stood up slowly and I got a better look at him. It was about seven feet tall, very thin, matted down fur all over the place with certain pieces gone. All this time he was just staring at me. His face looked like a pale deer head with large pieces of flesh missing. It opened its mouth, but there was no sound that came out. That's when I started getting a headache. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. That's when my eyes started to fade. And eventually, everything was blurry except for the creature and my hands. I finally screamed. Right as it came out, I fell over and I passed out. As I was falling, I could just barely see him run off at breakneck speed. My dad and uncle's wife ran into the room. I don't remember anything after this. But when I spoke up, apparently all I did was stare and point to where it was standing. The remains of the rabbit were still there. The next day, I told my dad that I didn't really want to be here anymore. My uncle's wife told me that she was going to get some stuff and leave. She came back with some spices or something. She spread them around outside and burned some kind of herbs. But it wasn't sage. Not that I know of. She said it most likely won't come back anymore. The rest of the trip went by without any issues. However, I was freaked out the whole time. Apparently, she wanted me to come back in a few months. She said something about this thing, that it damages her property non-stop, and that me, I, might have something to do with it. Fuck this, I guess. My story involves myself and three of my really good friends throughout my whole childhood. I will have them go by Kevin, Ryan, and Tommy, which I'm still good friends with to this day. I wouldn't be able to write this story without their help, their consent, and their experiences as well. Everything about this is real, and there is nothing made up in any way, regardless of whether we have been seeing things or not. The truth is that we experienced something very horrifying one night at my friend Kevin's cabin. We thought about actually sharing this or not, afraid of being made fun of. But we are ready to share it with the community. You had to be there to experience it. One of my friends actually suffered a nervous breakdown after the incident and needed counseling. I do want to let you know that I've always been a skeptic of the paranormal and I find it very hard to believe in many aspects. But I love to watch, listen, and read about it simply because I always love to have an open mind in life. An open mind, in my opinion, is a growing one. Whether this was paranormal or not, someone was there that night. During midsummer, around the middle of July, my good friends, whom I mentioned earlier, and I, would always make time to go up to one of my friend's family cabin way up north in the forest of Minnesota. Ever since we were kids, we would always go. 
always joined by my friend's dad, Kevin's dad who owned the cabin, and sometimes a few of our fathers as well. Once we were juniors in high school, we felt mature and old enough to go to the cabin on our own. Finally, without Kevin's dad, or any other adult supervision, I would like to mention a little information about my friend's cabin to actually help you picture the scenario. My friend's cabin is very remote and very small, sitting on a very big island. Other cabins were on the island, but the next one closest to us was about a quarter or half a mile away at least, which you could get to by taking a man-made path around the island. I want to mention that to get to my friend's cabin, you had to park on a gravel road on the opposite side of the lake, as his cabin was on an island, and take the boat across the lake about a half a mile to reach the cabin. I'm telling you, the lake is huge. My mind always had a tendency to run wild when sleeping there at night. The cabin was all one level with only two bedrooms next to one another, a kitchen living room connected, and a bathroom in the back of the cabin. Where you slept in the cabin, there was always at least one window in each room with no curtain at all. So it was very easy to see outside to the woods and lake. This is where my mind would go, as I always thought someone was looking in. Of course, nobody ever was. I had been to this cabin a dozen times throughout my lifespan, and nothing had ever happened. And the older I got, the easier it was to sleep. Now, for the actual event, we would stay a week's worth or four or five nights. On the third night during the trip, we were there on our own finally. We had set up a campfire and had been drinking beer all night. I don't condone underage drinking, by the way. We just happened to sneak some being the rebels that we were. We went out to his dog to gaze up at the stars and enjoy the buzz. When all of a sudden, we heard something towards the water. It sounded like a fish was jumping out to catch a bug. We quickly looked out the lake with curiosity, wondering where the splash came from. Thankfully, the moon was out that night which actually helped light up the lake. Otherwise, it would be dark as black with there being no city lights for miles upon miles, and we wouldn't have been able to see anything on the lake. Then, that's when my friend Ryan began to point out, and he said, Um, what the hell is that? After looking closely and finally spotting what he was pointing at, all I can describe it as, is that it simply looked like a head out in the middle of the lake, just floating around, staring at us. The distance was about three-fourths of a football field from the lake to the dock. There is no question that I could see its features. It had long black hair and very pale skin like a face, but I couldn't make out the eyes, the mouth, the nose or the chin, as if it was just a blob of pale skin with long black hair over it. I'll never forget the feeling that came over me. The hairs on my legs, neck, and arms all stood up. And I became paralyzed on the inside, ready to leave that moment. But we told ourselves it was just a loon, as the birds are very active on the lake and do their hunting pretty late. And they also have black and white colors on their coats and hunt by diving deep into the water. So it was possible that a loon all of a sudden popped up in the water after hunting a bit. Or at least we tried to talk ourselves into that scenario. All of us started having the creeps and noticing it wasn't moving one bit. It seemed like it was just standing in place. We went back to our campfire. We got it brighter and headed inside to drink more. I would like to mention that there was a staircase outside my friend's cabin about eight stairs and length down to the bottom where the fire pit and the dock was. We soon forgot about the head with the help of the beer. That's until I had to use the bathroom really bad. And the one inside was preoccupied. I just went outside to do my business since we were in the great outdoors. As I was using it and glancing out at the beautiful moonlit lake, I noticed that the black circle object was still there. But it seemed to be 30 yards closer now. Still looking as if it was staring right at me. Now... I could see the nose on this thing's face. Again, it was very pale. 
like it hadn't seen the sun for years. A very, very uneasy feeling came over me and I quickly went inside. I told my other friends to come outside and look, keeping my eyes glued to it at the door to the cabin. We came outside to see and it was still there looking at us. It seemed like this head was corked up at us with its chin in the air. Nobody dared to go down to the dock anymore, and we all quickly went back inside, ruling out that it was most likely not a loon, because a loon wouldn't be in the same water spot. Eventually, the current would have drifted it somewhere else in a rocking manner, for a loon to stay in the same spot for almost an hour or two made no sense to any of us. This head-like object was stiff as a board, and it wasn't moving a single muscle just staring up at us from the dock instead. There was also no ripple effect at all in the lake. By where this object was at, we said it was just a log and went back inside. I could tell that everyone else was creeped out as well. A few hours passed. It was super late into the night at this point, and we knew that we needed to get some sleep. Being my curious self, I looked back outside once more and this black object had completely disappeared. I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief thinking that the log must have just floated off or just hit the shore somewhere. As we slept with the windows open that night, there was no AC in this cabin and we had to open them or we would fry in this cabin with it being the middle of summer and all. Me and my other buddy, Tommy, slept in the living room while my two other friends slept in the two separate bedrooms with their doors open. Not being able to sleep but keeping my eyes peeled shut. That's when I began to hear someone walking around at the bottom of the stairs to the cabin. Whoever I heard down there was off the dock now, pacing back and forward as it made the sound of a boot clicking on the wood. It was almost like they weren't sure what to do with themselves. It lasted for about three minutes. Wanting to whisper to my buddy but frozen in fear, I just kept my eyes shut and ears on full alert. The footsteps sounded like they took two steps up the deck stairs all of a sudden, but then turned around and it sounded like they were sprinting out down the man-made path. After it sounded like the steps were long gone and a couple of minutes had passed, I woke Tommy up asking if he heard the steps. Both of us sat up. I was startled to see my friend Ryan walking out of his room and saying that we need to leave a minute after these steps vanished. He must have heard us talking so he felt he could come out as well. But either way he was waking us up regardless. Something was very disturbing about his expression and I asked him why. He then woke up my other friend Kevin in the other room and said let's go. We gotta get to the boat. Asking him, What Ryan? What the hell is wrong with you? He explained to us quickly while grabbing his stuff. And I will never forget what he explained. Nor will any of my other friends. He said when he was turning sides on his bed to get more comfortable. He saw someone. Looking in at the top right corner of his window. And it quickly shifted out of his view. He said all he saw was one eye, white skin, and black hair long down the window. Something else that I would like to add is that when we look back at what he experienced, it shows us to the bone realizing that this face was in the top right corner of the window in my friend's room that he was sleeping in, meaning that this thing was nearly 8 feet tall, standing on something like bricks trying to peek in or it was simply floating. Ryan then continued to say, let's fucking go, being very serious. It disturbed the fuck out of my mind and I felt like I was gonna be sick. I told him what my friend and I heard in the living room. We all agreed and packed our stuff and booked it, not cleaning the cabin or anything. We always had to clean the cabin before leaving, but this time we didn't. We locked up. And as we headed down the stairs, we saw footprints in the dirt, heading off into the path and all around the cabin. We picked up our pace getting to the boat, not knowing if somebody or something 
was watching us or around us. We threw our stuff on the boat, untied it, and sped off. I didn't even think about the head in the water anymore, nor did I decide to look into the water. Thank God. My eyes were just glued to the island, trying to spot anything moving, but I didn't see anything. When we had finally gotten our stuff packed in the car and the boat tied up, we hopped in the car and took off. We had been we had been driving for about 10 miles, and out of the blue, Ryan, who said he saw the person outside his window, all of a sudden broke down in the car, sobbing, saying, Fuck, what did I see? We called to tell our parents what happened on the way back, and that Ryan was freaking out, and they told us just to get home safe and quickly. It was late, about 5 o'clock in the morning, but no one slept, and it was a very quiet ride home. My friend's dad, who owns the cabin, went up that following weekend and said he experienced nothing while there. But he did mention that he saw footprints that were still lingering about, which he actually thought was strange because someone was walking around his property, which actually annoyed him. Whatever my one friend saw in the window really hit him hard. After his breakdown, he had trouble sleeping on nights and ended up having to seek some help for a couple of weeks and hop on some sleeping meds. As time went on, he ended up being fine, but he isn't too comfortable sleeping next to a window without a curtain. I can't explain what happened and why it seemed to happen to us, and I can't explain what I saw in the lake and especially what Ryan saw. Nothing's ever happened at that cabin since that night. At least that's what we were told by my friend's dad, who owns it. I, myself, have never decided to go back to the cabin, which really makes me sad because I had great childhood memories there. Tommy and Kevin both have gone back and been fine, but Ryan refuses to go back, and I'm with them on that. There's a lot of people that have cabins on this island, so it could have been a prank in the making that had been busted when Ryan saw the person at the window or the person possibly wanting to do something worse. I'll never be able to explain what was floating in the lake, but the fact that this incident, along with the footprints and someone looking in at Ryan at night, all happened in the same night, seems like more than a coincidence. Even though I'm fine, there is something that I will never forget. Imagine seeing a floating head out in the distance from your house. Or even worse, imagine waking up in the middle of the night or when you're going to sleep and seeing a floating head outside your window. I took a trip to stay in a cabin in the middle of the woods, high up in the mountains of the city of Ranger, Georgia. This neighborhood was 30 minutes up in the mountains away from civilization, and even the cabins were spread far apart. The front deck of the cabin was completely exposed to the woods, so I know that any animals could stroll along if they wanted to, but I stayed there for about a week, and me and my partner sat outside on the front deck every night, very late. And at no point did we ever feel like we were in danger. It was peaceful with fireflies out and sounds of crickets every night. That's until the fifth night. It was eerie. It was dark. The moon was covered very heavy. It was about midnight and all of a sudden, I didn't feel peace like I did those other nights. The forest went completely quiet and I felt a horrible sense of dread. To be honest, I was starting to fear for my life. All these crazy thoughts started coming into my head. I sat there in my chair looking out into the dark forest, trying to rationalize and calm myself down, that it was just my mind playing tricks. But then, all of a sudden, my girlfriend said that she felt unsafe. And that's when I realized it wasn't just me. That's when we both heard a blood-curling scream, 
and we pulled out a flashlight to see what it was. It turned out to be a gray fox. They do make some scary screaming sounds. The weird part was that this fox was running and had its ears and tail down like it was scared. This was in June and I had read that foxes scream like that when it's mating season or if they're in danger. I know their mating season is in winter and this happened in June so I do believe this fox was in danger or afraid. The cabin had three floors and we were able to climb out the window and sit on the roof because we still wanted to be outside and relax but it didn't matter how high up we were. I felt something truly evil and we stayed inside. The only other time I felt something so evil like that or like somebody was watching was when I had a few paranormal experiences at a haunted house. Georgia doesn't really get mountain lions that often. Maybe a bear. It didn't feel that way. It felt evil. One time I met an old Navajo guy. He said he was a retired Navajo police chief from back in the 70s. So I asked him what was the strangest incident he ever experienced. He said one time he got a call about a shooting incident somewhere around Church Rock, New Mexico or Gallup area. And when he got there, there was a family in distress. They had shot something and it took off. The family said it was a big dog or something and it was walking on two legs and it opened the gate and came into the yard so they shot it and it cried out like a human and it took off towards the railroad tracks so another police officer from the city of Gallup showed up a white guy they tracked the blood trail and followed it the blood trail was leading them along the railroad tracks and up to a big cedar tree and there way back in the cedar tree was something laying up there when they took a good look at it it was dead. He said it was a young native girl with long black hair. The upper part of this dead body was human and the lower part was distorted, almost dog-like. The body was painted and it was wearing some feathers as well. He said they freaked out and they called it in. They finally took the body and they did an autopsy and nobody could identify who she was, what tribe she was from, as there was nothing to identify her. He said they made a public announcement about the body on broadcast, but still nobody claimed the body. He said they even displayed the body in a glass case, and the public came to view it and still no one came to claim the body. He said they eventually took the body off display, and he doesn't know what they did to it. He said he left the police force because of this incident, and well, a few others that were similar to this. I think that native police rangers and EMTs have some of the weirdest strangest stories out there for they are the ones who respond to incidents first on the res. By the way I heard that the story is actually true. Apparently there were so many people that went to go see the skinwalker body that was displayed in the glass case for it was shown a long time at the Gallup police station sometime back in the 70s. They said it was a young beautiful native girl with long black hair. Everyone says that nobody was claiming her or even talked about too much about this because nobody wants to attract these things towards them but mainly because the family couldn't claim her as everyone knows that skinwalkers are family based. I want to start this story off by saying that I am Navajo and boy have I heard a lot of stories growing up on the res. While I never seen anything myself which I'm actually grateful for I have benefited by being around the people who have. There's a different kind of evil that lives in the quiet high deserts and in the deep canyons of Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, even Colorado in the southern area. I can only describe it as an ancient evil. Now there are helpful ceremonies, rituals, and traditions that are still practiced to this day. Hell, 
Even a local hospital has an on-duty medicine man, but it seems to be a double-edged sword. What I mean is there is also black magic, which most Navajo will not even acknowledge or speak of. We are very superstitious. You will find this with most First Nation people. From Alaska to Argentina, it's just something you don't do and fear that it will get the attention of unwanted spirits or harmful entities. Skinwalkers or Nadroshi are just a few stories that kept me up at night with the covers over my head. So here's a quick one for you guys. A Navajo tribal police officer was driving west on what used to be officially named Highway 666. It was lightly snowing, maybe one fourth of an inch, which is a lot of snow for home, and he sees an old woman walking on the side of the road. How she got there, or where she was going was apparent because she was so far out in the middle of nowhere. He didn't see her right away, but as he passes he noticed that she is dressed in traditional clothing, a dress, a shawl, and her hair in a traditional bun. This actually isn't too odd. Many elders still choose to dress traditionally. But why was she out in such cold weather? And this late at night? Hitchhiking? Maybe. He passed her too quickly and now has to turn around. And as he makes a U-turn, he notices she is nowhere to be seen. This is fairly flat terrain, and he for sure saw an old woman walking. He pulls the squad car over and steps out with his flashlight. Confused, he manages to find the woman's footprints in the snow. He follows the footprints until they suddenly turn into what look like dog footprints, leading away from the road in a hurry. He immediately jumps back into the squad car and meets up with another officer near his patrol. He is a little shaken up but then tells the other officer if he has ever seen anything like that. The other officer tells him that he has. He also explains that sometimes it's an old woman, sometimes a very beautiful young girl, but always on that road and always in the snow, waiting for the right good Samaritan to let her into their car. I still get nervous driving those wide open spaces at night. I keep my eyes strictly on the road and turn my music up high. I rarely ever pick up hitchhikers, but I for sure will never pick one up at night. So let this be a warning to each and every single one of you that if you ever come around this area or what used to be called Highway 666, don't ever pick up a hitchhiker. It might just be a skinwalker taking you home. When I was 23, I had a security gig at a dairy farm in Ohio. It was a modest place only holding a few dozen cows at any given time. My then co-worker, a 34-year-old recovering meth addict named Corey, had just been fired for letting a cow go missing on his watch. An offense that would get you fired in every sense of the word. For starters, Corey was insane. By the time we met, he was seriously addicted to all kinds of drugs, and it rendered him virtually schizophrenic. Long nights were spent with him during my training period. He would tell me about the CIA and how they were out to get him. He was convinced that they were broadcasting thoughts into his head and that they would stop at nothing to ruin his life. More than once, I would catch him glancing over his shoulder or peeking out of windows with a dumb look on his face, hoping to catch a glimpse of whoever was following him. That's the type of person that Corey was. Each of our cows had an ear tag label with a number. At 8 p.m., they were each to be guided into their own respective stalls and locked in for the night. 
padlocks became the norm after an incident with local kids a few years earlier. In the mornings, we would have to carry around a clipboard containing each lock combination and individually release each one. It was the most annoying way to start the day, but the cows were more secure that way. That's what made Corey's story so unbelievable. He had claimed that the previous night, cow number 29 had been locked away in her stall along with the others. He told us that the only thing out of the ordinary that night was a bat stuck in the rafters that he planned to deal with in the morning. In order for his claim to be true, an intruder would have unlocked the barn with a set of keys, unlocked 29 stall with the correct combination, then reset the locks and leave undetected. Either that or they picked up a 1600 pound animal and leaped through a window. Considering Corey's nasty habit of abandoning his duties in order to twitch and hallucinate in the corner, a small part of me believed that some two-bit thief might have been able to get one over him. My boss, however, a 50-year-old hothead, concluded that Corey must have been involved with the cow's disappearance and kicked him to the curb. With nobody else to fill his position, my boss had offered to pay me extra for each of his duties that I could complete until we received a new hire. Naturally, I agreed. I would be heading back to school in a few weeks and needed all the money I could get. My first night back at work began normally. Since I would now be doing the work of two security guards, I would arrive early to get a head start on Corey's checklist. I started out by sweeping out the barn. Farmhands tried to keep the TMR in a long pile just in front of the stall door so the cows could eat throughout the night but that shit practically painted the floor by the time I got there. Midway through, I noticed something reflective in the corner of the barn. I swept a loose bit of corn and hay over it to investigate. On the floor before me was a neon yellow ear tag, and I picked it up to examine it. 29. Next to 29's ear tag were the skeletal remains of a bat. I guess that was just another thing that Corey never got around to dealing with. I swept up the bones along with the rest of the barn. By the time I finished it was already 8 p.m. I made my way out to the fields and one at a time I guided each cow to its assigned stall. I got through about 10 or so before I noticed something strange. Across the field, about 50 meters away from everything else and all the others, was a cow alone. It faced away from me, seemingly transfixed on a nearby cornfield. Seeing a cow on its own is nothing strange, as they sometimes need personal space the same way as people do. What was strange, though, was the way that her tail stuck straight out from behind her, unwavering. She stood as if she were afraid to slip, with her feet planted far apart. Perhaps the strangest of all, her head appeared to be tilted at a 90 degree angle. I wasn't eager to tell my boss, they had already put down so many sick cows before, but losing two in the matter of a week might have been enough to send them over the edge. That's when I decided to save that cow for last, as I continued to guide the rest of them inside for the night. Being in charge of twice the amount of cows I was used to was time consuming. It took me nearly an hour to round them up. By the time I locked number 36 for the night, it was 9 o'clock. I should have been making my rounds by then, especially given the circumstances. I just had that last cow to deal with. When contemplating how long it was going to take me to unlock each cow in the morning, I realized something that made my blood run cold. The only stall left empty was number 29. I shuffled to the field, and surely enough, she was there. She hadn't moved an inch since I started the process of moving them. I approached her slowly. It was surreal seeing a creature frozen in such an odd position. As I came up on her, I could hear a definite, but muffled, chittering. It was unlike any noise I had ever heard from a cow. What the fuck did you eat? I thought to myself. I whistled to the cow before approaching her to avoid scaring her. On a dime, the chittering ceased. The cow's left ear rose to face the sky and began to oscillate like the periscope of a submarine. 
I could tell that moving this one would be a challenge. I rubbed her back attempting to calm her down. Bonding is key when establishing any sort of relationship with an animal. I had never interacted with 29 before, so we were unfamiliar with each other. Her skin felt bizarre, like clay with hide draped over it. I walked around to see her face. Her eyes were peeled open, darting around. Her mouth hung open and drooped to the side. I examined her left ear, searching for a place to reinsert her tag, but there was no piercing. I strapped the halter to 29's mouth and began to lead her. It was like trying to uproot a tree with a bike chain. Each tug that I gave was useless. I began to put my weight into it, but still, no luck. When I say no luck, I don't mean that 29 wouldn't follow me. I mean that her body shows zero sign of being affected by my body weight whatsoever. Cows are strong creatures, but they're not made of stone. I was perplexed. After 15 minutes of this, I decided that it was useless to continue on. With the clock ever ticking, I could no longer afford to neglect my rounds. I began to walk to the security post to collect my flashlight and get on with the night. I heard a slow trotting. I looked behind me to see that the cow had in fact moved. 29 was now facing me. Not so shy now, I wonder. I turned around and continued walking towards the gate. When I made it halfway through the field, I began to hear the trotting again. But this time, it was louder and much quicker. I smiled to myself. Wish I would have known to walk away sooner. Without turning to face the cow, I walked into the barn and began fumbling with 29's padlock. 3 left, 32 right, 23 left. As the lock clicked open, I heard the floorboards behind me creak. A slow, vocal noise turned to a sickly gurgle. I hope to God whatever you got isn't contagious, I said before spinning around. All color drained from my face as I was greeted with the sight of the eight foot tall beast standing before me on its hind legs. Its ears were flapping like a hummingbird's wings. Its head was cocked sideways with one eye focused on me. Its pupil seemed to grow and shrink as it scanned over my entire body. Its lower jaw slowly moved up and down as it began to vocalize again. It began to creep towards me. Its front legs were kicking as it attempted to keep balance, all the while making that same noise. I began to feel lightheaded. I grabbed 29's padlock and made a break for the door. That's when the cow began to stomp behind me. I began to hyperventilate as I sprinted. The rest of the cows were spooked, shaking and jumping around as well. I slammed the door shut and clasped the padlock. A sickening boom shook the entire wall of the barn as 29 began to claw at the door. Oh, oh, oh. The beast croaked before chittering once more. I backed away from the door slowly, its wooden frame bending and contorting at the sheer force behind it. Without another warning, I turned my back to the barn and ran to my car as 29 began wailing and pounding. I never ended up making any rounds that night. Instead, I started my car and left that fucking place in the rear view mirror. I didn't even tell my boss. In fact, I avoided several of his phone calls because I had nothing to say. I figured it would be best if I just quit the easy way. There are certain things in life that back you into corners. Silence forces your hand, you know. That's why I'm writing this now. I still wanted my money. A few weeks later, just before making my two hour drive back to college, I stopped by the farm to pick up my final check. My boss wasn't in his office on Tuesdays, so I took advantage of the situation and granted myself access with the key that I had seen him kick under the rug once or twice. After snagging my check and a few Jolly Ranchers, I got in my car and slowly began to drive away. Out of the corner of my eye, a young farmhand standing in the grazing field caught my attention. I lowered my window and said, hey kid, stay away from the night shift, but he didn't answer me, nor even look at me. 
he just continued to stare at the pile of bones before him. As I kept driving, I kept staring at him, and he wouldn't even move an inch. That's when something struck me as odd. His head was tilted sideways, similar to 29's head. I swear, I'm never going back to that farm again. I never told this story to anyone, and I don't really intend to tell it again. I have a pounding migraine today, and this thread has kept me good company as I drifted in and out. I actually don't like talking about this time in my life. When I was around 12, I lived with my mom. We were below the poor level. We lived up in the mountains around Santa Cruz, California. My mom had a friend that owned a large bit of property up there, and he let us stay in a trailer up there. Our trailer was very small and was right beside a garden. A chain link fence ran around the garden to keep the dog the owner had out, along with other animals. All kinds of deer and things are very common in the area. Also, along the fence area was a single room. It was like a tiny house but it was only a single room on the inside. This room had light, and since our actual trailer didn't, I spent a lot of my time in there. By the way, sorry that the story will be fairly long. I'm actually pretty bad at writing. I just wanna say that first, as this will be the only time. So there's this one thing you should know right now. This small fenced in area was only a small part of the property but most of it was just a bunch of woods. Also, I refused to leave the fence area because the owner's dog had been mistreated by children in the past and was very sketchy towards me all the time. If I was alone, it would try to bite at me, even through the fence. The fence was tall, at least seven feet high, and wasn't even movable. So as long as the gate was closed, I was safe. With that being said, there is no one else around us for miles and miles. Now I'm telling you all this because I think it's important that you understand what kind of scene this was before I already get into the story. So we have a fenced in location that seems fairly safe. It contains a trailer and a single room with power that is not connected to the trailer. Nothing else around for miles. My mom's van is parked out in front of the gate to the fenced-in area and a single unpaved road runs from this garden for about a mile to the main house. Now then, I would bring friends up there to sleep over here and there. We all thought it was pretty cool, you know. Besides, we would get our own room to stay in to play video games all night long. It was like a dream come true. The only downside was simple. When it would get dark outside, it would get really dark. No city around and the trailer would not be lit up. There was no bathroom to use in the room and you would have to walk through the dark garden in order to get to the trailer to use it. Strange things would happen out here from time to time. It was always something that could be somewhat easily explained away though. Noises like people working at night or once me and a friend were sitting out in the garden and we saw a shadow as big as a small bear bound up a tree but the tree didn't shake like there was weight on it the dog also creeped me out but you know angry dog and i was a kid it happens now i do get scared pretty fast i always been that way for example i have trouble walking through a lit house if i'm alone my friends however tend to be more outgoing, just the kinds of people I get along with. This time, I had a friend over. His name was Jacob. We were staying up all night and playing Sonic the Hedgehog 3 on my Sega Genesis. We started playing as the sun went down, and by the time we were finishing up the game, it was around 2 a.m. That's when we heard it. We turned off the game getting ready to find something else to play. There was a rumbling in the woods behind the room we were in, like somebody was rolling something really heavy around. 
we hadn't heard it before because the noise from what we were playing was loud. I immediately got goosebumps. Jacob was not really worried about it, but it's not like there was someone else's house a yard right over there. It was just a forest for miles and it sounded like someone was constructing something or some shit, dragging and rolling something really heavy. Eventually, Jacob convinced me to just play some more games. I agreed on the condition that we turned the volume down so we could hear if something happened. We started playing, and I didn't even notice that the noise had stopped because I was into the game. A couple hours later, Jacob said he had to use the bathroom. I was feeling fine by then, so I was fine when he left to the trailer to relieve himself. He was taking a while, so eventually, I decided I was going to go check on him. Besides, I could use the bathroom and grab a snack while I was at it. I got up and opened the door to leave. And when I opened it, he was just standing at the doorway. Right outside the door, facing it. It scared the shit out of me. That's when I asked what he was doing. And he just stood there, blocking the exit. I realized he must have sneaked up to the door because I could hear him walk away from the room. But I hadn't heard him walk back up to it. It was super quiet out there without the noises of the city. I should have been able to hear. But he refused to say anything or respond. He just stood there. I told him he was really creeping me out. But it wasn't like him to try to scare me like this. Finally, I decided to just go to the trailer and use the bathroom myself. I told him what I was going to do. Then I moved past him, but when I pushed him out of my way a little, his skin felt freezing to the touch. I jumped a little, but it was a cold night and he had been standing out there for like 30 minutes, so I figured that was to be expected. I walked as quickly as I could over to the trailer. And that's when he followed me, like, right on my tail. It was unnerving. I joked a little, saying that he already surprised me by scaring me at the door. The joke is over already. Finally, I got to the trailer and walked in. He didn't follow. He just stayed at the doorway. Now, I want you to picture this. Imagine inside a trailer with the door open in the middle of the night and your friend is just standing outside a trailer looking in. I checked on my mom who was fast asleep. Then I turned to go into the bathroom. It was a portal potty and we keep the bathroom door shut because it smells bad. When I reached for the door and tried to open it though, it was locked. That's when I heard a nervous voice come from behind the door. Um in here. I quickly turned to look at Jacob, but the door was still open and there was nothing there but pitch black night. I froze. I would have heard the bathroom door open if he had come in behind me and gone that way. There is no way to do it quietly. That's when I just yelled out so loud that my mom woke up. I stared at the doorway unable to bring myself to move a muscle. She got up, walked over there, and looked out. Not seeing anything, she closed the door and asked me what was wrong. By now, Jacob was coming out of the bathroom and acting perfectly normal, but just a little bit confused. I explained what happened, and Jacob said he was just taking a long time in the bathroom, basically. None of them believed me at all, no matter how much I insist. My mom is sure that I just got sleepy and imagined it. And Jacob thought I was trying to prank him. So my mom gets out a big flashlight and walks us back to the room. She tells us to go to sleep. Then she leaves and goes back to the bed herself. Now, this room doesn't have any windows or anything. So after a while, I calm back down a little bit. I'm telling myself that my mom was right. It must have been like a waking dream or something. Meanwhile, Jacob insists that he was in the bathroom the whole time, and I'm inclined to believe him, 
because there is just no way to really get around without being heard. So I settled down, but I'm a little rattled, but I'm thinking that I can just sleep it off throughout the night. Suddenly, the dog starts going nuts, right behind us. The room is up against the fence, so the dog must have been like right behind the room on the other side. I guess when the dog started going nuts, I got scared because Jacob started laughing at me and said, the dog barking at a squirrel or some shit and you're over here shitting yourself. It keeps going like that for a long time though. Suddenly, the barking stops and gets replaced by whimpering. We hear the dog run away. There's about 45 seconds of silence before we hear something new. A small stretching sound on the back wall of the room. We both try to be silent as we can. Eventually, it stops. After five or so minutes of silence, Jacob decides to be brave. He decides that he's going to wake up my mom to tell her something crazy is going on. I wish he wouldn't leave me alone, but there's absolutely no way I'm going to go out there. He arms himself as best as he can with a tennis racket we had in the room with us. Then he takes a couple small steps and opens the door and dashes out. I close it as quick as I can behind him. In less than 30 seconds, I hear a scream. Not long after, the door flies open and he comes back in looking pale as a ghost. He looks tired and his breathing is like he just ran a marathon. His eyes look as big as dinner plates. I then ask what is going on like four times before he finally starts getting words out. He tells me he walked out there and he was walking through the garden as quick as he could and then he saw my mom just standing there. He tried to talk to her but she stared at him with a blank expression. Getting super creeped out because of what happened to me earlier. He took a couple more steps towards her telling her that he thought something was in the woods. Suddenly, her face turned to an awkward smile. Then he realized something terrible. He hadn't noticed sooner because of the darkness. She was on the other side of the fence. Now, the door to this room does not lock. And as I explained earlier, this room had no windows. As he is telling me what happened, he is also at the same time putting stuff in front of the door. And by the end, I was helping him. In retrospect, whatever was harassing us seemed to not want to actually enter the room or the trailer. Because the Jacob one didn't come into the room or to the trailer itself. Either way, we stacked everything we could against the door, thinking somehow like in cartoons, this would actually definitely keep the creature out. So for the rest of the night, we heard scratches coming from all around the room. I, of course, ended up crying. Jacob looked like his mind had left his body with fear. At one point, whatever was out there was speaking as well. I heard it from right next to me where I was resting against the wall. In my mother's low voice. The same exact phrasing she had used earlier in the night. What's, What's wrong? wrong? Followed by, go to sleep. The sun must have come up eventually. The scratching as well stopped. We heard my mom come to get us. This time, we actually heard footsteps. We of course refused to leave the room. My mom had to go get the property owner and have him take the door off. When we saw that it was actually her. I burst into tears again. We never had any experiences like these again, and we eventually moved away. But that one night still haunts me. I still refuse to go out at night, unless I'm with a bunch of people, and I will never, ever live in the woods again. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed hearing about this, as I probably won't tell the story again. Thanks for listening.
I was in prison for 15 years. There was a skinwalker in there with us. A little background first. I was serving a 15 year sentence in a penitentiary in South Arizona. What I was in there for isn't important. But when I was staying there, there were countless things that happened that no one could explain. And even more, that no one wanted to know more about. It all started with a prison legend. They said that years ago, something awful and unexplainable happened in the prison. Every morning we would wake up and be expected to stand near the front of our cells while guards visually confirmed we were present and accounted for. Apparently about a year before I got sent there, the most brutal and unexplainable thing happened during one of those routines. A man who had a cell to himself looked very off. When the guard saw this, he pulled over another guard to help him check it out. They found it wasn't actually the prisoner they were expecting at all. It was a totally different man. And this man was wearing the skin of the other man over him. But apparently, it looked like a real monster. The scariest thing was that the guy wearing the skin was not an inmate. They had no idea how he even got into the prison. What's worse is that they couldn't even figure out who the hell he was. He wasn't documented anywhere. And what's worse than that? They never even found the body of the man of the skin he was wearing. Pretty scary stuff, I know. And I realize that's not the go-to definition of a skinwalker. But that's what the prison called him. The skinwalker. It didn't help out that the guy never talked, apparently. Anyways, that's what started the whole skinwalker superstition around the yard. Apparently, the guy got shipped to a different spot about a month after it happened. And just about everyone here felt all the better for it. I heard about the story on the second day of my stay. Hell of a story to hear, to place in your home for the foreseeable future. Now, onto the real shit though. Sure, that guy was the skinwalker, but all he did in the long run was get an old Navajo inmate to tell everyone about actual skinwalkers. It seemed like a lot of the prison culture actually revolved around them. Now apparently, skinwalkers are tricky to point out on the spot. But if you manage to survive around one for more than a minute or two, almost everyone can tell the mannerisms. They can mimic human speech, but not replicate it. They twitch manically. They have an unnatural gait while walking. But apparently, they got better with experience. The old Navajo guy, his name was Carl, said that he was sure there was an actual one among the prisoners, slowly picking us off over the years. He called it the Grandmaster Skinwalker at one point. Apparently, he thought it had human mannerisms down so well that you might not even been able to tell if it was your cellmate for a day or two. He would expect the Skinwalker to jump at any opportunity for a kill. But this one realized it had a revolving door of people to kill coming to it. A lot of guys found humor in it. A lot more were really on the edge about it. And every once in a while in prison, people snap. Sometimes you will find your cellmate swinging in front of the bunk strung up around the neck by his pants. Sometimes you just can't take it anymore. But in our yard, people tended to snap in a very special way. It wouldn't be an outburst at dinner or a silent suicide in the night. Guys would just stop talking, hunch over and shuffle around. Any friendships they had would be mostly out the window. They would turn into a loner during wreck time they would let their hair hang in front of it, in front of their face. 
No one liked to talk about it. Like, if they did, it would happen to them next. I felt the same way too. I didn't know if it was a skinwalker or people just going crazy. But I didn't want to find out. It wasn't clockwork or anything. But every time someone snapped in this way, it wasn't more than a couple weeks before they were quote shipped off or quote transferred to God knows where without anyone else knowing beforehand. Then there were nighttime occurrences. Short and a loud burst of sound echoed through my cell block during all hours of the night on a regular basis. It sounded like a mix between a pig dying squeals and nails on a chalkboard. Just another thing no one likes to talk about, even scarier, were the shadows and footsteps. The block was dimly illuminated in the night by a few lights hanging from the ceiling outside the cells. I myself saw shadows fill across my wall on a regular occasion. One time, near the end of my sentence, I woke up, looked at my back wall, and found the perfect silhouette of a person standing there. But when I looked, my bunkmate was asleep, and no one was really outside my call. And the footsteps, everyone hated the fucking footsteps. They were the scariest part. In the night, sometimes, more rarely than the shadows, you would hear ungodly, fast footsteps. They sounded like wet feet slapping on the tile floor. Whatever caused them would fly from one end of the block to the other in a dead sprint. Whatever it was, it was inhuman like and it was very fast. If you happened to be awake before it started, by the time you heard the footsteps on one side of your cell and whipped your head around to see the thing run by, it sounded like it was three cells past you. Everyone hated those fucking footsteps and I agree I thought they were the worst I was released from that place about a month ago I have more stories than I can count I swear it was nearly my turn about a week before I was discharged my cellmate and a good friend of mine snapped in the same kind of way I didn't sleep for an entire week well I did sleep of course but never for more than a few minutes at a time Never turned my back on the guy. The scariest thing though, was when I woke up one night to him, somehow, snaking his body through the bars of our cell. For reference, I couldn't get anything past my shoulder through them. And the worst part of all of this, was that he was coming back in to our cell. On the day of my release, I didn't say a word to him. Just left, and he seemed fine with it. And so was I. I had made it through 15 years of prison fights, gang disputes, and for all I know, skinwalker abductions. I left through the front gate, a free man. As I walked along the fence for the wreck yard, I spotted my cellmate standing off on his own. Similar to how he was for the last week or so, I shook my head, not even really sure if it was him anymore. I took one last look over the yard, this time from the other side of the fence, and I wish I hadn't. There, standing off on his own, on the other side of the yard, was Carl, slouched over, looking at the other inmates, and twitching manically. I'm 25 years old, I live in Utah, and I'm curious if any of you have seen anything like this before. I'm pretty sure I saw a wendigo, or a skinwalker. I know it sounds strange or crazy, I don't really believe in those things, and I'm really skeptical when it comes to the paranormal. This happened to me when I was 17, and in high school, living with my parents. My house at the time was in a very small town. The backyard faced open empty fields and mountains for miles before you could even reach another civilization at all. My best friend lived next door 
and share this field as our backyard in a way. Also, by the way, I have to explain that his house was built on a different street that ended in a field. I think there was supposed to be more houses built down the street to expand the town, but they clearly never got around it. So this was where his driveway was at, even though no other houses were built there. The reason I'm saying this is because this matters later on in the story. I used to stay the night at my friend's house a lot in high school because I didn't have the best relationship with my parents. Every once in a while we would wake up to hear dragging and a weird gargling sound from the back porch. His room was a basement room with the window well to the back porch. It would happen maybe a couple times a month, but whenever we would gather the courage to check, nothing would be back there. And this happened for many years. However, there is one specific night that haunts my friend and I to this day. My friend was getting ready to move and we would stay up all night playing games and watching movies. So we decided to go on a music drive to just vibe. So we hopped in his truck with high beams and swung out of the driveway, turning them on towards the field to use the roundabout. The light of the vehicle illuminated this thing. It looked like a person, but it wasn't. It was naked on all fours, abnormally large. It's limbs that seemed to fold under itself in an unnatural way. It's pale skin was clung to it, like it had to be stretched onto it. But the part that still sends shivers down my spine is its face. Its jaw hung open to this gapping black maw, like a snake unhinging its jaw to eat. Its black eyes glisten in the light as it looked at us. But just as it turned to see us, it quickly scurried backwards, almost like it was on rewind into the brush of the field. My friend and I were pale as a ghost. We both looked at each other like, did you see that too? We were shaken. Let's just say we tried to have a good rest of the night, but we couldn't believe what we saw. We ended up just sitting there in his basement with guns ready and waiting to hear the gargling and dragging again, but we never did. Sorry that the story doesn't have a climax, but I swear to you, all of this is true. I now don't live in that town anymore. There are times when I do go visit, and that empty field still feels like it's watching and waiting. Even though I can't see it, I can still feel like it's out there, somewhere, waiting for me. My boyfriend Jason and I, we went on a month long camping trip to multiple states. Everything was going really well until October 9th. We decided to ditch a campground reservation and randomly pitch our tent near Albion Basin with the Uinta Mountains in Utah, not far off the secret lake trailhead. We parked our vehicle around 3 p.m. at the Albion Basin campground which was close for the season. It was a little tense because this was our first dispersed camping attempt and we had no proper backpacking gear. When we arrived, we realized that the area we wanted to pitch our tent was about two miles uphill. At this point, we started to express regret as we had a planned campsite in Nephi, Utah that we decided to skip on a whim. After grumping around a bit and having a large lunch to avoid packing food, we packed our backpacks with the best gear we had to get through the night as it was going to be 25 degrees Fahrenheit. We set out up the trail, seeing the occasional family or couple heading down the mountain. As we walked, we both started to feel a bit strange, as if we didn't really even know why we were doing this. We should have just gotten a hotel instead of trying to play backpackers for the night. 
but we both felt like we had something to prove, so we continued. We made it up to Secret Lake, totally empty, so nothing like the pictures, disappointing and eerie. We keep hiking up in an attempt for seclusion and flat land when we stumble across a decent space. I see a small cave in the distance and point it out to Jason to deliberate if it's a hell no kind of situation. But after he checked it out, he says it seems like a small animal crawl space. No biggie. We set up as nightfall was quickly approaching, played some cards, bundled up, and decided to go to bed early around 8.30 p.m. as we planned to leave ASAP in the morning, maybe around 5 a.m. We both dwindle slowly, and after what feels like 30 minutes, at 11.24 p.m., I woke up with a feeling I have never experienced before. I woke up wide awake, scared, when I always sleep through the night. Jason was asleep, so I let him be and just lie there, alert, trying to listen to anything I could hear, which was nothing, very silent. Around 12 a.m., Jason woke up stirring, much to my delight as I didn't want to feel alone anymore. I told him I couldn't sleep, but he suggested I just rest my eyes as we were leaving early in the morning. I agreed, initially not wanting to be a baby and say I was very scared. This, however, was very short-lived as Jason could not fall back asleep himself and we ended up laying there together, trying to sleep when I ended up blurting out that I was scared. We agreed it was time for us to just stick it through the night as it was now approaching 2.30 a.m. and we had a small axe and a pellet gun for protection so I didn't need to be feeling too scared. Not even five minutes later, we're still wide awake and Jason's head perks up so fast my heart jumped out of my chest and I whispered, what is it? He replied, listen, and I shit you not. We heard the sound of gravel crunching under boots, as if someone walked up to our tent, stopped, and then walked to my side. I felt the blood drain out of my face in an instant. In real time, this all occurred in no more than 10 seconds. But my mind flashed a million thoughts, and for a second, I was convinced it was a ranger coming to tell us we could not camp there. So I called out. Hello? My brain, entirely sure I heard human footsteps. But within two to three seconds of hearing the footsteps, Jason grabbed the gun and burst it out for any chance to confront this person, as I knew he heard exactly what I had heard. But nothing. There was nothing there. As soon as Jason burst it out, and me after him, there was nothing there. We heard something walk up so clearly, but nothing walked away. Barely exchanging two words, we packed up our stuff, looking over our shoulders, terrified, feeling like we were being watched, and booked it down the mountain with only moonlight guiding our way. Too scared to turn on our flashlights. This was the worst 20-30 minutes of my life half expecting to look over my shoulder to find someone following us. When we made it to our car, we locked the doors and started going down the mountains, almost speechless and scared out of our minds. At this point, we reached town around 3.30 a.m. and slept in a well-lit parking lot of a grocery store. We have obviously discussed what happened that night and we are both haunted by the sound of those footsteps. My mother is visiting my brother's family just east of Nevada. My brother and his wife have a night out and mom's watching over the kids who are three and five years old at the time. She has just gotten them off to bed and goes into the living room to watch her programs. She nods off in front of the TV and is awakened around 11.30. 30. 
she says that she hears whistling, not the bored, absent-minded kind, but by someone who is really good at it. She finds it strange that someone would be outside at this time of night, not only whistling, but seemingly close to the house. She goes over to the picture window. The moon is bright, the reflection casting a pale glow upon the rooftops of the nearby houses that are on the reservation. When suddenly, dogs from the neighbors saw start barking at once. They sound scared, and they are barking like if it's a warning. Despite the noise, she now hears a different whistle, the kind of police use or sports officials. And it's coming from there, by the road, which runs along the side of the house. She puts on her robe and goes out to the porch and around to that side of the house. There in the road is this guy who, when he notices her standing there, says that he's the local medicine man. He holds up his whistle like it's some kind of badge. He then tells her there is a skinwalker running through the neighborhood and that she should go back inside and lock the door. My brother finds out the next day from the neighbors that there was a critter of some sort jumping from one roof to the next. So anybody listening to this, if you ever hear whistling out at night, don't go outside. If you hear any noises outside your window at night, don't go outside. And whatever you do, don't ever say a word or whistle back. This event happened just south of Polaca, Arizona, within the Navajo Reservation. A pair of skinwalkers, they say, an old couple that lived deep back in the reservation, were seen lurking around this small cattle ranch. Two heifers had disappeared recently, one of which was discovered down by the creek and mutilated. The man who owned the ranch, his two sons, and his brother armed themselves and went out to try to run them off. One of the sons, not yet 18 years of age, was searching out beyond the barn when a dark shape materializing from the darkness itself loomed up in front of him, almost nose to nose. As the boy attempted to raise his rifle, the figure raised its hands up to its face as if it was going to yell something. The boy, trying not to look at it in the eyes, then felt something rush into his face like dust or sand. Even though he tried not to, he ended up taking a breath and some of it was inhaled in. Immediately, things went dark and he started experiencing hallucinations. The others found him only minutes later, on his knees, holding the sides of his head, and his eyes rolled back. He fell to the ground and went into some sort of trance. His body limped, and he became unresponsive. They carried him back to the house, and they summoned the local medicine man, who came and said some prayers over him, but he told the others there was nothing to be done but to wait for the dust, traces of which were still on his face and his shirt to wear off. He promised he would come back the next day when the sun was up and bless the Hogan. Later, after he had regained consciousness, the boy swore to the others that he was the victim of a dog-faced creature. He described it as not quite as tall as he is, thin and scraggly, with patches of mangy and dark hair, a canine snout only shorter than a dog's, and with the smell of rotten eggs or worse. He said he doesn't recall anything more before passing out, other than not being able to breathe and having no control over his own body.
before I begin, I would like to say that this is a very long story. It's been something that's haunted me since I was six years old. Since my first encounter with it, I had dreams about this and two very specific encounters with the creature. I'm sharing this story so I could possibly find help on what to do or how to get rid of this creature that's been hunting me since I can remember. Just for background, I'm a 21 year old female and still worry about this creature finding me, but I'll get into detail why later. For now, here's my story. I would always go camping with my grandparents, who I call my gammy and gampy. At the end of my school years, I would always look forward to it since I grew up loving the outdoors and the woods. I especially loved camping, loving the idea of having s'mores, taking long hikes, being around the campfire, and of course, the wildlife that we would see. Now, I grew up in California, mostly near cities, so the forest was like my true home to me. I always prefer being near trees and dirt instead of buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were more quiet and more peaceful. I always felt safe when I was there, like nothing could ever hurt me. But something strange would always happen at the end of the month of May. I would have this reoccurring dream during the last week of my school year. I would be in the woods, walking alone, down a dirt trail. The woods were always quiet. I would continue to walk this path until I saw this red fox poke its head from behind a tree. Its eyes were always strangely human-like, but they were yellow and somehow looked like teddy bear eyes. And it would always just stare at me. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch me. Usually, in my dream, I would go up and pet it, making the fox finally make a noise, mostly a soft growl. Then I would continue walking, and it would follow me. The first time I would have this dream was when I was actually around five years old, and it lasted until I was about 11. As the years went by, it would be the same exact thing. I would walk in the woods, find this fox, pet it, then continue on with my hike with it alongside me. But when I was having the same dream on the fourth time, it would start to walk behind me. That's when I started to feel uneasy about this fox. I could hear it making odd noises, but every time I went back to look, it was just walking like nothing was wrong, even somehow giving me a smile. Sorry to go on about a dream, but I now believe that this was a warning of the creature. Now that the dream is out the way, I can talk about my first true encounter. I was six years old and I was going on a camping trip with my gammy and gampy for about a week. Of course, I was very excited. I was barely able to keep myself in school for the last day of kindergarten. They had picked me up right as the bell had rung and already had the camping trailer attached to my Gampy's truck. I remember he drove an old red truck that only had three seats with me being always in the middle. It took about two hours to get there and another good hour to find our usual camping spot. It was deep into the woods and far from other people, as my gammy wasn't too fond of being around other people while we were camping. As they were setting up the camping trailer, I wandered around the campsite, loving to dig in the dirt for bugs. I had sat down on the dirt and started to dig, but I noticed how quiet the woods were. It was never quiet, not even in the dead of night. I thought it was odd, but being only six, I didn't think too hard about it. As I continued to dig for bugs, however, I thought I heard my gammy call for me. She would always call me Sugar Booger. That being a nickname she gave me since I was born. That's what 
I had heard, but it sounded like she was very far away and somewhat sick. Trigger bugger. I looked up where I heard it coming from, which was from the woods, but there was no way she was there because she was still unloading stuff from the truck. Even at the age of six, it didn't feel right. So I walked closer to my grandparents and stayed next to them. I soon forgot about this weird encounter I had as we began to have fun. For the rest of the day, we played card games, sat next to the campfire as we ate dinner and stared up into the stars. I always loved seeing the stars. There was never any where I lived at. We started to get sleepy around 9 p.m., I believe and we started to get ready for bed. There were bunk beds that me and my gammy would sleep on, keeping our luggage on the top bunk, and we would sleep on the bottom bunk. Due to my gampy snoring, he would sleep on the couch of the trailer. I would always sleep next to the trailer window, just in case I couldn't sleep and wanted to look outside. I fell asleep pretty quickly though, that being the last day of school and all, it was pretty exhausting. I remember waking up maybe hours later. It was still pitch black outside. It wasn't weird for me to wake up late in the night since I always had sleeping issues. I rolled onto my side trying to fall back asleep until I heard sugar sugar. My eyes immediately shot open as I heard my nickname being spoken. But I knew it wasn't either of my grandparents. They were both asleep, and they were never known to sleep talk before. I started to feel this horrible feeling in my gut, like whatever I was hearing wanted to really hurt me. Even at the age of six, I knew this wasn't normal. Then, I started to hear tapping at the trailer window. It was soft, but loud enough for me to hear it. I just sat there frozen in fear. I was trying to just brush it off as tree branches or rain, but I just knew it wasn't it. I could tell it was really someone or something tapping on the window. Then I decided to be brave and look. Big mistake. I pulled the curtain away to only peek and all I saw were these large yellow eyes. They seemed glassy yet not real they looked like giant teddy bear eyes but cold and unwelcoming i remember in that moment i panicked and quickly closed the curtain back up i then hid under the blanket that being the only thing i knew to do when i saw a monster i could feel tears falling down on my face i never had been so terrified in my life i just curled up into my gammy side and clung to her all night long. That damn tapping, only getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. I don't remember falling asleep, but somehow I did. I do remember my gampy waking me up around noon, saying how if I got up quick enough, we could still go fishing, but I didn't want to leave the trailer at all. Terrified that whatever I saw the night before would still be out there. I did eventually go outside, but I was just looking around, horrified that whatever saw me last night would get me. My gammy immediately knew I was scared and pulled me into a hug when she saw me, asking me what was wrong. I did tell her what I saw and heard, and to my surprise, she believed me. The next thing I know, She was telling my gampy that we were moving campsites. It took a bit to convince him, but he did eventually start to pack up and hook the trailer onto his truck. I was put into the truck so I could fall asleep, but I just couldn't. I kept feeling that I was being watched, thinking that every little noise was that thing I saw. That if I closed my eyes even for a second, it would get me. My gammy wasn't too far from me when I heard it again, but this time it was my actual name, Aaliyah. In that moment, I had never seen my gammy move so fast. 
She looked up into the bushes where we heard it, then to me. She then got in the truck with me and pulled me into a tight, protective hug. I began to cry all over again, telling her how I wanted to just go back home. That's when my gampy got into the truck as well. And since I was crying so hard to the point I was coughing, he agreed we could go home. We started to head out the campsite, still hurt that this trip had been ruined by something. But I still didn't know what. That's when something in my head told me to look back. I slowly did, feeling an ice cold fear wash over me as I saw something, a red fox, sitting in the middle of the campsite, sitting there with large yellow eyes, the same red fox from my dream, somehow curling its lips into an eerie smile. After that encounter, we never did go back to that campsite. We did continue to camp, but in more populated areas. I never told my grandma what I saw, but she had told me to trust my gut. She knew that I was sensitive to certain entities, and that would help me if I trusted it. Now, this would be the end of the story, but I'm afraid it isn't. There was one more encounter I had with the creature, and it was much more terrifying than the first time. The second encounter I had was when I was 17, many years later. By this time, I knew very well what a skinwalker was now, and I was still very paranoid every time I went near wooded areas. I still worried about seeing that fox, but I never really thought about it too much. Me and my two younger siblings were staying at a relative's house for Christmas, them living way up into a mountain area. I think they were my great aunt and uncle, but I'm not sure. Where they lived, there was no service at all. So unless we hooked up into their Wi-Fi, we had no phone. I didn't mind the house. I was still loving the woods no matter what happened. Even though at night, I hated how they didn't close the window curtains, making it easy for anything outside to see inside. But I did feel safe while inside the house, knowing that they wouldn't let anything hurt us. Lucky for all of us, it didn't snow where they lived, so we could go outside and run around. They also had this beautiful black lab. She was about a year old, her name was Pam. She was very playful and normally wouldn't listen to anyone but my uncle. One of the days we were there, my little sister and our aunt went out to the store for a nice girl's day. Even though I'm a girl, I wanted to go hiking with my uncle and my little brother. We left pretty early since the hike we were doing was four hours of walking into town. It was a really chilly morning but since we were doing so much walking, it felt great. We also decided to take Pam. It was a good way for her to get some exercise and have fun. About maybe an hour into our walk, I started to slow down a bit, wanting to enjoy the beautiful forest. It was so peaceful, I could have stayed there. But as we continued to walk, I started to feel something odd. I noticed how quiet the forest had become. Hearing only footsteps and my brother talking to our uncle, Pam noticed it too. Her ears going straight up and growling softly. I started to pick up my pace to get next to my brother. I was worried that possibly a coyote or mountain lion was nearby, but I knew that they wouldn't be out at this time though. Even if they were, they didn't walk near the roads. My little brother was only nine at that time. And being the oldest sibling, my natural instincts to protect him kicked in. My uncle noticed the silence as well, telling us to stay close to him and Pam, who was now next to me and still growling. I began to feel that horrible feeling again, that ice cold fear I once felt when I was six. I tried so hard to not think of the creature, but it was all I could worry about. I was scared. I felt like I was back to being that scared little six year old girl again. I had to stop for a moment though, seeing my shoelace came undone. I quickly kneeled down to tie it back up, trying to hurry and just get out of there. And that's when I heard it. 
In that moment, my heart dropped into my stomach. My eyes were widened, and I could just feel myself start to shake from fear. It was right next to me. I heard it clear as day. I slowly turned my head, and there it was. That same red fox still having those horrid yellow eyes and that same demented smile. Only this time, I saw it much more clearly. Its fur looked so matted and disgusting. The smell it had was like rotten, decaying flesh mixed with garbage. Its limbs were much too long for a normal fox. The back legs bending completely the wrong way. Those eyes were still the worst thing about it. But now, they looked emptier than I had remembered. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry, but I just couldn't. I was frozen as I was, too scared to even blink. Then, I heard it speak again. This time, however, it had mimicked my little brother's voice. Found you. Before anything else could happen, Pam suddenly jumped in front of me and started to bark like mad, snapping and growling so aggressively that it scared me out of my frozen trance. When I looked back, it was gone. I used that moment to run over to my brother and uncle, who didn't see what I saw, as they were too far ahead now. But I heard my uncle start to pray and sing a song under his breath, keeping my brother and myself close to him. I was just too scared to even look back, so I just kept my eyes on the ground and refused to stop walking. Pam had stopped barking, but she was still growling and never left my side as we continued our hike. My little brother was a bit worried, but he just thought it was a coyote. When we finally made it into town, my uncle had called our aunt and told her to pick us up, saying something about how it wasn't safe for us to walk back. Thankfully, she did come and get us, but she was confused since we talked about that hike for days. On the car ride back, Pam never left me alone. She was right with me the entire time. She knew that thing was after me and she was protecting me. I was very grateful that she was with us. Who knows what would have happened if she wasn't. When we got back to the house, I was talked to by my uncle and aunt. I told them what happened and what I saw and then they started to pray and check that all the locks were shut tight. My aunt started putting something around the doors. I now believe it was most likely ashes, but I never did find out. Unfortunately, this made our Christmas vacation cut short as they were worried that I was not safe while still in the woods. We had to be taken home the next day. They made an excuse of how there was an emergency with a friend and that they had to help them out. I felt horrible that this Christmas was ruined, but once I did leave the woods, I truly felt safe again. Before they had to drive back home though, they told me that it wasn't my fault, and that lucky for all of us, it didn't hurt me or the other kids. It did make me feel a bit better, but it still brought up a lot of questions and worries. It was still around. How? Why? What did it want from me? Does it want my skin? My soul? Was I just going to be tormented by this thing forever? I still don't have answers to these questions, and that's what really scares me. Now, I have long moved from California, and now live in Kentucky. I do live in the woods, but so far, that thing hasn't found me. I know that seems very stupid on my part, but life had changed a lot. When I was growing up, I was given no other option to live somewhere else, and my grandpa in Kentucky was kind enough to let me live with him. So please don't call me an idiot for moving to the woods when I had no other choice. Anyways, I am happy it hasn't found me, but I'm still worried. Can it still find me? Is it still hunting me? I'm not close to anyone who knows truly on how to get rid of this thing. And that's why I'm telling my story now so I can possibly find help. So please, 
If there's anyone out there who does know, please help me. My friend and I were at a party on the Hopi Reservation in Polaka. It was getting late and we had a pretty good buzz on. Most of the people we knew had already trickled out, so we decided it was a good time, as any, to leave. We looked around for the friend who was supposed to give us a ride, because we had all come together. We found him in a back bedroom, drunk and passed out, so we had no choice. We're gonna have to walk. The two of us lived on the other side of the gulch, a good two miles. Between were nothing but trees, scrubs, brushes, and some hills. We had barely cleared the houses onto the road passing between the wooded area when we got this funny feeling we were being watched. We decided to leave the road and cut through the trees. It wasn't the easiest walk, but it would cut the distance down some. And even though it was pitch black outside, we knew the way pretty well. We had been a good 20 minutes off the road and heading up towards the hills when that same feeling of being watched came upon us again. We both turned around at the same time, but it was so dark we couldn't see anything. But then, my friend Paul swore he heard some kind of cackling or mumbling. I didn't hear anything except for maybe the wind and the top of the trees at our back. By that time, none of us was going to admit it. We were feeling a little scared. Without saying a single word, we picked up the pace, moving along pretty good but not running. And that's when I heard it too. But now, it was more like heavy breathing. Paul then grabbed my arm and gave me a tug forward. We took off running straight up the hill, which wasn't that big, but it was still enough of a slope so I wasn't feeling it in my legs. And on top of that, I was drunk. Think about this for a second. Running up a hill, at night, drunk, complete darkness. And as you're running, you hear footsteps behind you and heavy breathing. Whatever it was though, stayed with us every step of the way. Right at the top, Paul and I stopped and turned around expecting the thing to be right on us. But we were standing there, huffing and puffing, and looking at nothing but darkness. A few seconds passed, and then we heard a thin laughter, as if it was coming from down the hill and back from where we started running. We decided to keep moving and put some distance between us. We turned to go down the other side of the hill, and there, standing right in front of us, was this creature. It was standing up on two legs, like a circus dog, only much taller, with both paws extended out in front of it. It had this coyote face, and it was grinning at us, all of its teeth exposed, and its tongue sliding from one side to the other. I couldn't believe how skinny it was, as if it hadn't ate in weeks. It's rounded stomach sticking out like one of those African kids in the charity ads. And the skin sinking between its ribs. The smell was unbelievably bad. Like the smell of an old, wet dog. We both jumped back with a scream. Like two little schoolgirls. As we did, the creature dropped down on all fours. And ran past us and down the hill back where we had come from. It was yipping and laughing all the way. Paul and I started praying like never before, swearing to Jesus that if he got us home safe, we would never drink again. The laughing, or whatever you want to call it, died down and disappeared. Wasting no time, the two of us made our way down that hill and into the trees that separated us from where we lived. As we walked along, we were trying to convince each other everything was okay. It was only a coyote out searching for a meal. 
We scared it, it jumped up at us, and then it ran away. We started feeling better about things overall. We got across the open field and into the trees. We made it all the way through there without anything else happening. However, just as we stepped out towards that first backyard that we needed a cut through to get to the street, we heard this unmistakable chatter, like some little monkey laughing coming out of the trees just behind us. It was followed by the sound of something moving through the branches and twigs. My friend Paul then yelled out some words that he said that his grandmother had taught him. And just like that, the noise ceased and it got real quiet. He then grabbed my arm again and we ran. We ran as fast as we could through that yard and out to the road. We ran straight for the house where Paul lives with his grandmother. When we got there, we found her awake and sitting in the kitchen with only a small candle for light. She was burning some cedar. When she saw us, she put her finger up to her lips and then pointed to the outside of the house. Her lips were moving, but silently. We stood there still for a minute or two, and then she spoke out loud, saying it was okay. She then said a prayer and that the skinwalker was now gone. I have no idea how she knew, and I didn't care. Needless to say, I spent the rest of the night there, sleeping where I knew I would be safe. <laughs>